Okay. Welcome everyone to Google Hangout, organized by UN Women, um, on how we can recognize, redistribute, and reduce the unequal burden of unpaid care work on women and girls. My name is Rachel Anderson, and I'm the Women's Economic Rights Coordinator at ActionAid International. For over four years, I've been working on the issue of unpaid care work, and it continues to activate and inspire me as one of the key women's rights struggles we face, wherever we are in the world. Much of the concepts and issues we'll discuss today are informed by the research and advocacy done by feminist economists and feminist researchers today. No doubt it will be an engaging discussion. We are fortunate to have with us today John Hendra, the Deputy Executive Director for Policy and Programs at UN Women. Hello, John. Hi, Rachel. It's great to be here. Great. And Magdalena Sepulveda Carmona, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Hi, Magdalena. Hi, Rachel. A pleasure to join this, uh, this initiative. Great. Thank you both for being part, part of this discussion. Last year, um, in October, Magdalena presented a report to the UN General Assembly highlighting the links between women's unequal share of unpaid care work and their human rights violations. We'll use the time we have today to ask John and Magdalena a few questions regarding the report and the relevance this issue has for governments, UN agencies, and the post-2015 agenda. We will then open the discussion for your questions and reflections. Please note, um, this discussion will be recorded and uploaded on the UN Women YouTube page. So if you get dis disconnected along the way or have any problems with the connection, don't worry, you will be able to hear the entire discussion later on. Many of you joining us uh, may already know quite a bit about this topic. But for others, it may be new. So to start us off, I wanted to share a short definition developed by Diane Elson of Feminist Economics of the term unpaid care work. So unpaid uh, means that the activity is not paid for and differentiates this, this activity from care provided by employees in the public, private, and NGO sector, such as doctors and nurses. Care indicates that the service nurtures other people. And work indicates that these activities take up time and energy and are done out of love at times and or social obligation. So unpaid care work, put simply, is all the domestic work, cooking and cleaning and washing clothes, water and fuel collection, and direct care of persons, such as children, um, people living with disabilities, elderly people, as well as well able-bodied adults that's carried out in the homes and in communities. Uh, as you all know from personal experience, care underpins all of our societies. It underpins economic growth and productivity, social development, well-being, and social cohesion. So it's fundamental. Um, the aim is not to reduce the time spent caring for children or other members of the household, but to share out the responsibility for unpaid care work more equally between women and men, and importantly, between women and the state. So my first question, then, is to Magdalena. Magdalena, can you tell us a little bit about why unpaid care work is a development and human rights issue? Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, the heavy and unequal distribution of unpaid care is various to women's greater involvement in the labor market, impacting productivity, economic growth, and poverty reduction. Most importantly, I think, the lack of recognition, the unequal distribution, and the intensity of unpaid care work uh, and the fact that it's not adequately supported undermine the dignity of women caregivers and obstruct their enjoyment of several human rights on an equal basis than men. From my point of view, it is hard to think of a single human rights that is not negatively impacted or cannot be potentially impacted 
by the unequal distribution and the drudgery of unpaid care work. Think, for example, on the right to education. Girls' chances on life might be obstructed at the very early age if they are prevented to go to school because unca uh, unpaid care responsibility. More often, those are the extreme cases, more often the girls' chances to uh, succeed in the school attainment at the same level than boys are impacted because uh, they do not, because of their domestic responsibilities, they do not have the same time to do their homework, to networking, or to um, to engage in the in extracurricular activities at the school. If girls do not have the same chances than boys to perform in school at the same level, then their chances to get, for example, later on in life, a decent work will be also impacted. Another important concern is uh, the right to health. There is so much uh, care that somebody can take without damaging their own physical and mental uh, health. Um, often, uh, the unpaid care work can be stressful, arduous, and, and very difficult. And often, women that have a very heavy unpaid care workload are unable to access healthcare facilities because of lack of time or money. And another critical point is the right to participation. Uh, the, unpaid, the unequal distribution and lack of support of unpaid care work limits the possibilities of women to, uh, and girls to engage in public life at the community level or at the political level. So it is a fundamental issue and it is the right time that we address it as a human rights concern. Thanks very much, Magdalena. Do you think you could say a little bit more about um, the costs of providing care unequally that are borne perhaps differently by different groups within society? And why that's also important in link linking to human rights violations? Certainly. Although women undertake the bulk of unpaid care work in all social classes and level of income, the amount of unpaid care work increased heavily when uh, women are, are living in poverty uh, and also increased in the intersection of other grounds for discrimination. So if women are poor but also migrants or coming from a minority or an, uh, a, a minority ethnic background, their, their workload increased. Basically, we can, we can say it's simple that women living in poverty and suffering from, uh, from a variety of discriminatory grounds, uh, they have less access to pay for services that will diminish the unpaid care work that they're providing or will relieve their work. And also, they're, quite, uh, they're more likely to live in uh, regions, in areas that lack the infrastructure and they have access to public services. Great, thank you very much. My next, my next question is for you, John. Um, and I'd like to, I, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about the kind of economic and social policies that can actually increase women's share of unpaid care work. Well, thanks, Rachel. And I think maybe there's four or five policies I would I'd like to briefly touch upon. I think, first of all, is, is economic social policies don't, that don't really um, actually recognize um, the unequal share of, of, of unpaid work and it's that, that, that don't make it visible. I think it's, for, for example, um, unpaid care work and calculations of GDP and systems of national accounts often doesn't show up. It's invisible in, in, in public policy making. So I think it's really important that the value of this work is recognized. So those policies and those um, policies from a statistical point of view that do not recognize unpaid care work, I think, is a real challenge. In fact, you know, if unpaid care work was assessed a monetary value, it would make up anywhere between 10 and 40 percent of, of GDP. So it's a huge amount of, of, of a country's uh, income and economy. I think a second point is that economic social policies that assume or rely on women's unpaid care work to, to, to fill the gap in terms of provision of public and private services, uh, ch child and elderly care, K-12 
care for people with, with, with disability. Um, I think the assumption is that unpaired care work is sort of an unlimited resource and that, that it will never run out. And of course, that's not true whatsoever. And, and I think, as you know, across the OECD, um, women do nearly two hours uh, a day more unpaid care work than men do. So, I mean, the, the, the size of, of, of the challenge and how important it is to have appropriate policies. But I think third and most important, I think, is, is sort of the impact of, of, the, of the economic crisis and austerity policy. I think these are clearly economic and social policies that increase women's share of unpaid care work. Um, too often, austerity measures in many countries in Europe in particular result first and foremost in cuts in pensions, in social protection, in, in essential health services, other benefits, just when they are most needed. So that women are really disproportionately affected by these cuts. And then they also have to pick up the burden um, of, of um, social services and support. So it means that responsibility for, for care shifts from the state really on the shoulders of women. So, so I, I, I think that's really and reinforces gender inequality, reinforces unequal power, power relations and, and broader gender-based discrimination. So I think particularly um, the most harmful economic and social policies are, are, are those I think linked uh, as, as we've seen in the last two or three years on, on austerity and the economic crisis. But maybe a couple of others in this country where I am right now it, 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 in the United States, it's, it's one of the few countries that does not have a law that mandates parental leave. I think that's also a, a, a policy uh, that is really, really detrimental in terms of uh, addressing unpaid care work. And even as the UN, I must say, I mean, I think it's really important to, to, to ensure the availability of early child education. So the lack of availability of early child ed childhood education exacerbates women's share of unpaid care work. And for example, at the UN, there's no education support given to children under five. So again, there's an underlying assumption that, that, that the care will be, will be uh, given and taken up elsewhere and, and, of course, largely by women. So I think there are a number of economic social policies that can really exacerbate the situation. But I would say particularly we, saw it, we see it so, stark, uh, 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 so, so starkly in terms of um, policies taken in terms of the economic crisis and, and austerity. Thanks, John. Um, Magdalena, would you have anything to add to that? Well, I fully agree with uh, what uh, John uh, just said, and, uh, and I think that what I would like to add is that really when economic and social policies do not take into account the gender distribution of care are quite likely to have a negative impact on women's uh, enjoyments of rights. Uh, for example, while social uh, protection scheme can play a crucial role uh, distributing care, the, if they are designed without taking into account the additional unpaid care or the additional burden of care that uh, they can uh, entail, they can have a very negative impact. This is the case, for example, of the most conditional cash transfer programs implemented in Latin America. Uh, which do not explicitly consider the burden that the conditionalities place on women. Uh, for example, a recent report of ECLAC uh, shows that in Ecuador, poor women recipients of the conditional cash transfer programs engage in 38 hours per week in unpaid care work compared with 33 hours per week of other poor women that are not recipients of the program. So. Uh, I would like to emphasize the point that John mentioned that it's, it's critical that all public policies and interventions should be designed, assessed and implemented with a care lens. Thanks to you both. Um, and I think maybe just to add, uh, abusing my role as moderator, uh, is to is to also say that um, economic policies, not just in times of austerity, can also have impacts, and they will have the most significant impacts on those living in poverty and those most marginalized. So, linking back to what Magdalena was saying around the intersectionality um, and the fact that the human rights violations uh, that are a result of economic policies that either deregulate labor or lead to cuts in uh, public services are going to hit those who are most marginalized and those who are living in poverty hardest and in some of the most difficult contexts. 
So um, my next question then um, is to you both, um, and you've both started touching on it already, so maybe you can expand a little. Um, what policies need to be in place to reduce women's unequal share of unpaid care work in order to fully enjoy their human rights? So, Magdalena, why don't we start with you, since you left us off with the example of social protection. Well, uh, first of all, I was said, I mean, I will repeat what I just said in terms of that all social policies and interventions should have a, 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 a unpaid care or care lens. Uh, another very important issue where we should all start is that uh, care should be value and measure. Unpaid care work should be value and measure. And in that sense, uh, time use surveys are a critical tool and relatively low cost tool to be able to have disaggregated data uh, in terms of um, uh, the amount of unpaid care work that is done by men and women, and then being able to have public policies that are based on evidence and uh, taking into account this, this burden. And thirdly, I would say that it's particularly critical to have gender sensitive infrastructure and public services. Um, in, in this sense, and it is particularly so in regard to uh, disadvantaged areas, as, uh, as you mentioned and, and I, I was saying uh, before. For example, development uh, of energy and water infrastructure has a drastic impact in reducing the amount of time women and girls spend collecting water and fuel each day. Increase access to publicly funded care services for young children and older persons, uh, as John was mentioning, would likewise allow more women to go out to work or take part in education and training. Therefore, these are, from my point of view, critical measures that are kind of the, 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 just the, the minimum a core obligation that every state should put in place in order to better redistribute uh, and recognize uh, unpaid care. Thanks, Magdalena. John, would you like to add to that? Well, great. I mean, I, I fully agree with uh, what, what Magdalena said. I mean, I think there's four key things that, that the governments really must do. I think, as Magdalena said, in terms of really ensuring that unpaid care work is measured properly and included in national accounts, and she talked about the time use surveys, which I fully agree. Secondly, is ensure that you know affordable, quality uh, social services, including care services, are available, and fully agree with her in terms of having a robust social protection system in place with benefits throughout the life cycle, from education subsidies at 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 one level to to pensions. So I think that's really critical. I think also clearly gender responsive infrastructure and and as, as as we know in terms of water and sanitation and energy that's critical. We know that 70 over 70 percent of the burden of collecting water in um, sub-Saharan Africa falls on women and girls. Um, I'll, I'll give another example. There's a, a recent study in, in Tanzania that said if the time for collecting water was reduced from th the, the, the distance was reduced from 30 minutes to 15 minutes, um, girls' education levels would go up by 12%, which is really quite a significant uh, figure. And if we could go from 30 minutes to 5 minutes, I mean, you can imagine the, the, the increase in terms of uh, a girl's right, right to education. And finally, I think one, one um, piece that maybe um, I'd like to add um, uh, to, what, to what Magdalena said is really in the importance that the state plays and governments play in terms of putting in incentives and including through taxation systems and also paid 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 parental leave for a more equal distribution of paid responsibilities uh, in the household. I think certainly countries like Sweden have provided affordable quality child care together with, with incentive for, with, for fathers to take paternity leave. The evidence shows there's a direct impact on the time the, the men spend with their children and, and in terms of the, the, the sort of the um, nature of their, the positive nature of their, um, their relationship. But for every month of, of leave a father takes to Sweden, um, the mother's earnings increased by almost 7%. And there's now some increasing evidence recently that also the men going back to work are much more, uh, much more productive. So, so I think it's really important for the state to put in place incentives in terms of, uh, in terms of the tax system, but also uh, in terms of paid, paid parental leave. Great, thanks. Just to, just to expand on that a little. Um, 
many of our guests and um, participants in today's discussion may be coming from countries in the south where there is a very large informal sector. Um, could you maybe just expand a little bit about what kind of policies where, for instance, uh, parental leave is not an option because you're working within the informal sector, what kinds of policies in that situation would be appropriate? And Magdalena, you talked about social protection, maybe you could expand on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, Rachel, would you like me to go first? Please go ahead, John, and then yeah, Michael. Yeah. So, so I, I think in terms of low-income economies and low-income uh, environments, I mean, I think it's really important. I mean, it's even more important, I think, the, the uh, issue in public investment in gender responsive infrastructure and technology, so accessible water and sanitation, electricity, improved uh, technology in terms of household use. This would lessen the burden of unpaid, uh, unpaid domestic work and, and really free up women's time for other pr pursuits. I think, though, also in low-income countries, it's really important in terms of accessible social services, and I would say in particular health services, and that's really important in terms of, uh, of reducing the burden of, of care that's often shifted to uh, to households and women in terms of, I think, particularly in, in poor environments in terms, in terms of health care. So, so it's sort of a, the same set of sort of policy responses in a way, but I, I think the emphasis needs to be much stronger on gender responsive infrastructure and, and appropriate um, technology for the household, but particularly I think in social protection, I think particularly in terms of, of, of health care and in terms of you know, accessible health care and minimizing what is sadly often the case too in terms of out-of-pocket uh, payments. As it being yeah. a, as it being a dominant form of, of accessing healthcare. Thanks, John. Magdalena. I, I fully agree. Uh, infrastructure and, and access to gender sensitive public services, and and also about the critical role that social protection play uh, plays in, in in this scheme. We have to see, for example, that there are good practices. Argentina, for example, uh, has in place a child benefit, an unconditional child benefit that actually uh, support and it's uh, all children and it has a particular focus for those children coming from, I mean, children that are in households of informal workers. So there are good policies in place uh, that expand social protection to informal uh, workers and are targeted to uh, to reach them, and, uh, and I think that the state should look at those good policies around the world. Thank you both. One of, um, uh, one of the sort of uh, issues that came up at the recent CSW uh, was that some participants suggested that unpaid care work is primarily a northern or development country issue. What do you have to say to that? John, I'll, I'll start with you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, first of all, I, I think I think it was really important that um, there was this discussion at CSW, and frankly, where we started with with the, on this issue, even uh, uh, the, the week before CSW, with the zero draft and the agreed conclusions of where we ended up, was actually quite a quite a huge change. And I think one of that's one of the two or three biggest changes in in, in advocacy, and and shows the use of CSW, and and also that's great to have this uh, Google Hangout. On, uh, in terms of this of this issue, because I think we really need to to continue the advocacy, and also I think uh, as you know, CSW this year focused on both the challenges and achievements of the MDGs for women and girls, and unpaid care work is one of the things that it was missing in the current MDG framework, along with any violence against women and girls and and many others, many other fundamental issues in terms of addressing gender inequality. So so I, but but I, I I think through the discussion at CSW was really became very clear that that the women's disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care work as we've talked about is a universal issue it's in every country it's at every level of development and whether it's caring for children housework or cooking or in the case of women in, in low-income environments much more it was we discussed in terms of fuel collection and water collection women really do bear, bear the bulk of, the, of responsibility for unpaid care work so I think I think I think we came a long way in that discussion that that it becomes that's a universal issue. We started with some countries saying that's only a developed country issue, and by the end of CSW, I think we we came a long way for the recognition that this is a universal issue. 
but I, th I think it does mean uh, the reality is we need different strategies according to the different contexts, which you've just said in the previous uh, um, question. I think it's important to look at low-income contexts and what's really needed there in terms of particularly access to social services that are most critical, and, and I argue, to healthcare, and also in terms of infrastructure, in terms of water, energy. I think also it's really important in terms of even high-income countries, middle-income countries, in terms of, again, the social protection, the life cycle approach. But also, I think in terms of more wealthier countries, in terms of ensuring that public crushes and preschools and, and elder care services. Um, so, so there's really much more um, um, sort of it, public social infrastructure available and also decent, decent care. And of course, also having incentives in terms of, uh, of, of, of parental leave. So it's a universal issue. I think we came a long way in the advocacy that this is that this is really a critical issue and needs to be a part of the post post 2015 agenda, but but it, it is clear that in different different development contexts um, we need to look at different strategies to really best affect the the uh, um, the reality. Thanks, John. Um, Magdalena, do you want to add to that? I I'm an optimist, so I try to think that uh, considering and take care of work uh, primarily as a developed country issue was a popular misconception that we have overcome thanks to the work of uh, women's organization and civil society uh, groups that have shown quite convincingly that uh, this is not the case, that it's that women living in poverty actually bears a disproportionately heavy burden and intense uh, unpaid care work that is impacting their rights. I think that reports such as uh, those done by your own organization, Action Aids, in the studies that uh, were done in Nepal, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda, uh, have clearly shown that uh, this, is, this is not the case that uh, unpaid care work, as uh, John said, is a universal issue uh, and although we have to tackle it with, uh, with different policy response in developed, in different countries, in low income and middle income and undeveloped country, it is a, a, a universal problem that uh, it is the right time to, to, to tackle. Thanks, Magdalena. Um, and then this is a final question for me, and then we'll open up to the floor. Um, and it's to you, John. I'm sure that lots of us uh, participating in this Hangout are curious to find out why it's important to include unpaid care work as a priority in the post-2015 agenda. You mentioned it was missing from the MDGs. So why is it important now, and, and how can we go about doing that? Um. Thank you, Rachel, and, and thank you for that, that question. And I, I think it's enormously important that we address unpaid care work in terms of post post 2015 sustainable development agenda. I mean, it, we because and I think it's really important that we we addressed un, unpaid care work. We had, we had addressed any vi any violence against women and girls. These really in terms, and we also address access to uh, uh, resources and 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 also uh, sexual reproductive health and rights. Some of these fundamental issues that really constrain addressing gender inequality and the root causes really have to be addressed. If we're to have a transformative rights-based ag agenda that will really make a difference. Because we won't be able to bring about real change and unequal power, power relations between men, women and men, or realize, as, as Magdalene has said, the human rights of women and girls, unless we really recognize and uh, uh, reduce and re redistrib redistribute the burden of unpaid care work. We can't expect to promote women's economic empowerment and really access to decent work and decent jobs, sustainable livelihoods, skill development, uh, or women's political empowerment unless their participation and voice, and I think Magdalena spoke, spoke very eloquently earlier about the right to participation at all levels, unless we really squarely address unpaid care work. And I think, you know, this, this women's um, unpaid care work and the, the unequal responsibility really constrains all of these choices and really constrains their access to realization of, of, of full rights of women and girls. So I think it's really, really fundamental. Um, I think it is really important that we got good language in, in, in agreed conclusions. Um, it's, it's very positive that in the open working group now, in uh, the latest draft that's come from the co-chairs, does have um, unpaid care work uh, as a target under the gender equality and women's empowerment goal. 
we are not we we as you and women are not yet happy fully with with the language we would like to see it talks about reducing the burden again it's not really looking at the recognition and the redistribution and it has to be a real it has to have a re, redistributive element to to the target because it's all about shifting the responsibility uh, and sharing and sharing this the, the responsibility but we are very happy we we in a couple of months we've come a long way from actually not having it you know really sort of alive in the zero draft of the agreed conclusion of CSW and today having it recognized as a target within the the, 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 the current draft of, of gender equality goal however um, only reducing the burden is not is not only the issue it's really much more than that it's more dynamic on the redistribution um, and and so I think it's really important that we continue to advocate that and really continue to advocate that the unpaid care is, is is a robust target within the framework but again you know if from a from a broader perspective if we were, if we were to have a transformative agenda that will really be able to address the root causes of gender uh, gender based discrimination gender inequality we really have to look at these deep city deep city issues like unpaid care work and, and really be able to 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 address them because they hold back uh, women's uh, full uh, women and girls full full realization of their human rights. Thank you, John. Um, Magdalena, unless you have anything to add, I'm going to open up now for questions from the group. Okay? All right. Um, so one of the, the first question that we have, which I'll take up now, and it's a question that I've encountered numerous times, is um, uh, Andreas Setre put down um, that she'd like to know a little bit more about the politics in this problematic. What will be, what's the best solution? Is it to pay housekeepers? Can maybe one of you respond to that? Magdalena, do you want to go ahead? Yes, I think that each society has to find his own way uh, to uh, to resolve the issue. But I also would like to stress that we have come very far away from considering that the issue is only to uh, have uh, wages for house um, housekeeper, uh, housewife. Uh, I think that all the issues that we just addressed with with John in this discussion, the emphasis on uh, infrastructure, public services. Uh, to have uh, social protection policies with a care lens are talking exactly to the way in which several states should address the issue of unpaid care work. Uh, I'm afraid that if we, uh, that again, this misconception that it's the issue of unpaid care work is related only to trying to have uh, uh, payments for, for housewives, it is it is the wrong path, and and we have to overcome that that discussion. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, I like to fully uh, agree with uh, with Madeleine. That's a very small piece and a slightly distorted piece, and I, I think it's all about um, enabling women and girls to realize their their full human rights. And I think particularly the the re, re, redistribution element of it is very important. And I think there's a, a real responsibility for for men and boys. As well, in terms of uh, of, of assuming uh, uh, much much greater responsibility, and also I think there's a lot of evidence in terms of how important that is, in terms of changing these again these un unequal power relations. This is an issue, not just just of of, of wages. It's an issue of, of inequality, and it, it's a, it's a, it's an issue of sort of much deep seated. Um, Deep, 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 deep seated, seated uh, discrimination. So it's really important that men uh, do do much more. And I think in terms of it's all also if we're if we're really going to advance on gender inequality, we need to rethink these very stere uh, gender stereotypes. And frankly, we need to rethink masculinity and 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 what that what that is and what that means. And and then and then in terms of what the benefit is for for the uh, man's man's relationship with, 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 with his family, his children, and, and also uh, more broadly. So, so I, I think that really, I mean, I think the, the whole nature of lean in, one gets a little bit, uh, frankly, cynical about it because it's, it, it's, it's easy on the lean in in terms of having resources for, for domestic help, but that's not the issue we're talking about here. It's about really the realization of, 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 of human rights for, for women and girls. Great, thank you, John and, and Magdalena. Um, we have two questions. Um, 
One is, what do you see can be a positive role for the private sector, if at all, towards change in, in regards to unpaid care work, to redistribution, I think, in particular? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start on that one. I think, I think the, the private sector can be uh, very positive in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, supporting, of, of supporting and mirroring sort of the best sort of public sector uh, uh, policies. I mean, obviously, the, the public sector, the state, has an obligation uh, as, uh, as a duty bearer, as, as, as Magdalena very uh, clearly highlighted. But I have to tell you, living here in, in the U.S., um, you know where, where frankly the state is uh, is far far behind states in Europe. I think it's really important that that the private sector you know starts to set much more uh, important and, and progressive policies in terms of pushing the state. And I'll give you an example that um, just in the last few months, I think the sort of the high tech companies that Yahoo now gives um, uh, parental leave to uh, um, accessibility for fathers uh, to take take parental leave for um, eight weeks, uh, Instagram and Facebook 17 weeks. I mean, it's still not what it needs to be, but I think the private sector can be more of a pace setter for those states that are really uh, sclerotic and really kind of, uh, you know, not not fulfilling their responsibilities as, as duty bearers. So I think in some, in some environments, the private sector can be a progressive stimulant. Okay, thank you. I I agree, Rachel. I think that the private sector must uh, play his role in ensuring a better uh, redistribution of uh, unpaid care work uh, and can set an example sometime. But I would like to stress, though, that it is also the obligation of the states to regulate and create an enabling environment in which this is not only voluntary uh, actions by the private sector, that there, there should be uh, some regulation in which the state take the role in order to setting the parameters and enabling the private sector to introduce uh, measures that are not voluntarily uh, that uh, allow for a better distribution of unpaid care work within the families and between the families and the, and, 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 and the market. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, there's one question that I, I think, um, John, I think it comes back to the post-2015 framework, so I'll address it to you, but Magdalena, please feel free to jump in. The question is, how are groups and networks of women who've been organizing around the issue of care for many years driving this agenda? How will they be part of the implementation of this if it is included in the post-2015 framework? How will they be part in taking it forward? Um, I think that, that, that's that's a good question. I mean, I think the first thing is we need to not be complacent, and we need to continue um, advocacy and civil society. I would say, in, in particular, has played a really critical role um, on this uh, this whole post 2015 discussion. So we need to we need to kind of continue to ramp up the advocacy that this is really critical. Um, it is really critical that we have. Um, not only a gender equality and and women's empowerment and realization of, of human rights for women and girls goal, but it be the most progressive and transform transformative goal as possible. So it's really important that we continue the advocacy. But secondly, I think this 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 framework will be a transformative framework if 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 I think the most important thing is accountability. And 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 so I think it's really important that women's organizations, women's groups that have long experience in this. Um, um, really um, contribute to making sure that there are uh, indicators in the framework to for, to really ensure um, accountability, and particularly I think in terms of following up what Magdalena said in terms of, of terms of the res responsibilities, the obligation of the state um, a, a, as a provider and as a duty bearer. Um, it's really important that 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 women's organizations, the civil society, hold governments to account for the indicators that will be hopefully inshallah in the framework at the end in terms of uh, in terms of unpaid care work so so i think it's really important um, in terms of accountability through through um, through governments i i think there's much stronger discussion about the role of parliaments and really ensuring that parliaments play a much stronger role in terms of accountability uh, in terms of monitoring and evaluation 
in terms of you know much 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 greater sort of transparency and 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 I think we're already seeing in these almost two million people that have been consulted through all these consultations. I think we're starting to see the the beginnings of social accountability. And I, I don't think any of us, or certainly I can't, because I'm not so tech savvy. But I can't. I don't know. You know, one, one can't predict what will be in place in five, ten years in terms of the use of social media to, to hold governments to account. So I think the accountability function inter, it will be really, really, really fundamental to to have a a, a transformative agenda that that we all want. I, I would like to 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 add, uh, Rachel, that um, if uh, unpaid care work is included in the post 2015 development agenda, will be a success. But it, it will be really the a very preliminary uh, step or first stage. Um, I, I think that we we must consider that uh, the fact that there isn't an equal distribution of unpaid care work it reflects the asymmetries of power in society. So it, it really requires that the women's organization continue the struggle for uh, gender equality and that women uh, to, to liberate women from these gender stereotypes that uh, put, put the role of women as the primarily or sol solely responsible for uh, unpaid care work. Uh, and I think that this also will be uh, very liberating for uh, for men and boys as well. Uh, oftentimes, uh, men are uh, constrained by the fact that they are seen by society as the, the the ones that need to provide financially to their families, but not so much in terms of of care. Uh, and the same with the, the community. So we need to uh, to change. Uh, the minds we need to uh, and ensure gender uh, fully gender equality. It it is a collective effort, and uh, and and therefore it required to 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 battle this this internalized status quo that see the role of women primarily or solely as as a, as a nurturer as a scare um, without uh, allowing them to also play other roles to have the, the, the right to choose and I think um, um Magdalena, one of the one of the questions that you and, and John are, are sort of alluding to that that you're answering in a way is about the need to not only portray care as uh, in terms of negative terms, in terms of the cost, in terms of the human rights violations, but also to portray it in a positive light. So and to show how important it is to society, encouraging uh, those who do not see it as important or those who are not contributing to care to take on a more equal share. Um, so that finding that balance between understanding the burden and the response and the unequal responsibility of care that women shoulder, women and girls, while also emphasizing how positive and important it is for all of us. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. So, sorry, John. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go ahead, Magdalena. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that it is critical what you said, and this is what um, we have been um, emphasizing. I think that uh, unpaid care work is the backbone of our society. It keeps our children healthy, healthy our workforce uh, functioning. It is critical, and providing um, uh, care is also can be also very uh, rewarding and satisfying for for the caregivers. Uh, so this is. The, it, it is uh, the problem is that it is it has to be seen as a collective would in that it has to be a, a collective responsibility and not only a women responsibility uh, and and then then we can move ahead if we better value and pay care work uh, then everybody will be able to those who are willing and 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 would like to do unpaid care work can be able to do it, and this is as well for men. Uh, there are several men that would like to uh, to take more care responsibility with their children, with their older parents, with their community, but they're unable to do so because the fact that unpaid care work is not recognized and valued, it it is also uh, it has no uh, economic. Uh, uh, value. Therefore, sometimes 
families and households need to um, to leave care aside a little bit because they need an income as well. Um, I, I I fully agree, and uh, but but and I think language is very important. I think the issue of reducing the burden is important in terms of in terms of burden as a responsibility. But I think the term burden can also have connotations that 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 care is is a burden. So I, I think we're not happy with the current articulation of the target under the the, the current draft goal because of the language reduce the burden. Because at the same time we have to look at you know these three R's to, to recognize it, to reduce it, and redis, redistrib redistribute it, and redistribute redis it both from a responsibility point of view. But also from from a you know a positive point of view, and and there is all this research that shows that you know fathers' greater involvement. I mean the men the, the role of men is critical. Fathers' greater involvement in their children's lives has benefited the children's education, for their income later on, for the nature of the that in, the individual man's relationships within within his broader family, and also now there's there's some recent evidence from Sweden that shows also in terms of greater productivity in going back to work, the much less sick days because of the, the general ha the ha happiness and, and the health. So, you know, the, there's some huge the, huge positive elements of it. So I think we need to um, be, be sometimes a little bit more nuanced in terms of the language because the language itself can be quite loaded to, to, that it's only a burden. It's about share, sharing that, redistributing that, that responsibility, recognizing how how great that responsibility and and that 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 care work is, but also find ways to ensure that 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 the that the huge intrinsic um, emotional uh, benefits of this, and I would say particularly for men to really become much more engaged, are 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 enormous. Great, thank you. We're we're running out of time, and I have there's one last question that's um, from one of the participants, and we'll lead, we'll finish up with that. Um, it, the question is, would you have any thoughts on how the tax system could tackle the issue encouraging redistribution between genders? But I'm going to add uh, encouraging redistribution between the state and women as well. So specifically around tax systems and the role that they can play. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I'm just, give me a second to reflect. Sure, sure. I, I think that tax system played a critical role to, uh, in enabling the uh, states to, uh, to comply with human rights. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, the, the, the way in which uh, they collect uh, money and the fact that they do have money that can then be invested in public services. Therefore, there, uh, if uh, a state increase, for example, uh, tax collection in a progressive manner, then that, that money can be then uh, uh, used to public services and this means also for example providing uh, child care facilities, facilities for care of older person, etc. and this will reduce the amount of uh, unpaid care work that uh, families or communities need to, uh, to undertake. Uh, we, we have to understand, I believe, that taxation uh, can play a critical role enabling uh, states to comply with their human rights obligation and this gives me the opportunity actually to, to pass a little ad but to my next report as a special rapporteur to the Human Rights Council in, in next June it is exactly on the role of taxation uh, and, and human rights so I, I, I guess that uh, that report really will try to, uh, to answer uh, the question that it was raised, and, and I think that it's a critical one. Thanks, Magdalena. John, would you like to say anything? Yes, pl yes, please. Thank you. Um, you know, I, f I fully, I fully agree as always with Magdalena. Um, but maybe it's just three or four uh, comments. One is, I think, how important it is uh, um, to look at tax and look at tax as, as a public policy, and look at uh, progressive taxation, and of course. You know, there's there's quite a bit of discussion. Well, there's a huge amount of discussion now about 
inequality, which is uh, rampant around the world. And, and really, I think, you know, in terms of tax policy, in, in terms of a, a, as an appropriate policy response in some cases, I think it's really important to ensure that in, in tax as an incentive that it doesn't penalize women from, from working. And in, in, in terms of ways that can be, you know, tax breaks and tax incentives, I think the whole issue of, of, of ensuring, you know, progressive, uh, progressive social protection policies. I mean, I think we, we um, again, if I just can, can argue uh, or, or point out from this country, the United States, where, you know, that's a huge percentage of GDP that goes every year to health care. I mean, it's, 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 you know, way above any other OECD uh, country. And yet it's still, uh, it's still uh, a, 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 a system where a lot of, uh, lower income people do not have a, a, a appropriate access. So, so I, th I think the, the, the progressive uh, taxation system, uh, system from a social protection point of view, but also in terms of tax incentives, in terms of inf infrastructure, and in terms of, uh, I would say, particularly in under undersourced and underutilized um, areas of a country, and I'm thinking more in sort of maybe in, in a low income environment, in terms of, of tax incentives, in terms of having much more effective um, infrastructure, um, incentives in terms of uh, building schools, in terms of ensuring uh, latrines for both uh, for both girls and boys, um, I think there's a lot of a lot of incentives that can be done around a much more gender responsive infrastructural investment. So, so I think I think tax is very important, and, and we're we're currently working on our. Uh, uh, Women's of the World's uh, progress report, uh, as you and women, looking at economic and social rights, and we will be very much looking at, at, at taxation and trying to comment on the current current sort of global public debate on inequality, but in terms of what some sort of potential tax um, uh, policies could be that, that will really uh, lead to a, a, a reduction of, uh, of unpaid care work. Great, thank you. And, and just to say that, um, we are similarly very concerned about these issues around taxation at, at, at ActionAid and we've been working for the past couple of years, um, since 2008, looking at redistributive policies, redistributive tax policies. So we're very thankful for this report from Magdalena and the work that UN Women will be doing this to really start to look at if we are talking about scaling up public services, how can we finance that through progressive tax policies? by tackling tax avoidance by multinational corporations and also harmful tax incentives that are being applied in lots of countries around the world. So I'm, I'm great that we can finish up with that um, in terms of something um, to look forward to uh, in our work and, and also to, to really address the inequality on a much larger scale as well. Um, I would like to say just a few words to, to finish up. First of all, thank you very much to John and Magdalena for a really engaging discussion. I think some of the key points that we can take away are really around the fact that uh, what Magdalena said at the very beginning, that unpaid care work affects all rights. It's not just one right. It is so overarching that it affects all rights for women and girls. Um, and, that, and that also the, the only way that we will get around addressing unpaid care work and the rights violations that can be, that, that it can result in due to an unequal share of unpaid care work is really through recognition, redistribution, and reduction of unpaid care work, and that collectivization of care, a sense of shared responsibility. Um, and that's changing, yes, social norms between women and men, but importantly and often forgotten, and I think this report really, this report and this discussion really focused on that, is between women and the state, and the importance of public services and of redistributive tax policies that can really make that a reality for women particularly uh, living in poverty and in the most marginalized uh, contexts. So I'd, I'd like to thank once again Magdalena and John and thank you also to the audience for the great questions and comments on the event page. I apologize that we've run out of time and that we haven't been able to address all of them. Um, but thank you very much for your engagement and interest in this discussion. Um, and finally, the video will be available on the UN Women YouTube channel. Uh, a recording of this video will be available. So if you've missed anything or if you happen to be in Australia and it's already 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, you, can, you can catch this um, you can catch this discussion at a time that's convenient for you. So many thanks to the organizers at UN Women and thanks again, John and Magdalena, for this discussion.
Rachel, thank you very thank much. You. You, you did a terrific job, and Magdalena, great to see you and to work with you as always. Pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.